Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so excited you're here today. We have such an awesome presentation today with our friend Patrick Casal. And uh, I'm going to give it a few minutes here as people are coming in. I see we have 128 of you already. I see you guys are lighting up the chat. That's awesome. We're seeing where everyone is from here. Atlanta, Vernon, Connecticut, Texas. Wow, we, we got people from everywhere. This is awesome. California, good morning. <laughs> we're from the Jersey Shore. Yeah, yeah. we've got people for coming in from all over the country. That's exciting stuff. I appreciate everyone making the time to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. Ontario, Canada. I like it. All right. Can hit the whole North America center. So uh, it's pretty cool. Fayetteville. Hey, Elizabeth. Wow. Miller. Some of the practice clinicians in here, I see. I like it. I appreciate y'all being here. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a good one, guys. We're so happy you're here. All right. North Carolina. Uh, Nashville people, I like it. Vance, I see you. Glad mm -hmm. that you're here. It's great. We love interaction in the chat. So, you know, stay active during the webinar as well and ask questions. We're going to have a Q&A at the end and Patrick will answer any of your questions that you have. Yeah, I wanted this to be as engaging as uh, possible. And for anyone who has questions or comments or feedback, you know, try to put them in the chat as we're going and I will try to answer as I can and, and respond and hopefully support whatever's coming up for you around uh, this topic. Yes, for sure. Hello. Hi, Heidi from Chicago. I'm right around the corner from you here in Northwest Indiana. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to get us started here. I'm going to introduce uh, Patrick. We're so happy to have you here today, Patrick. Patrick is a licensed clinical mental health and addictions therapist in Asheville, North Carolina. He's the owner of All Things Private Practice and Resilient Mind Counseling. Patrick works as a private practice coach and strategist and is also a group practice owner, a motivational speaker, retreat planner, and the host of All Things Private Practice podcast. Whew, he's busy. He has been featured on Private Practice Startup, Abundance Practice Building, Therapy Reimagined, Not Your Typical Psychotherapist, Selling the Couch, and Modern Therapist. Patrick is a passionate advocate, reducing shame and stigma of mental health, as well as imposter syndrome. And Patrick helps mental health entrepreneurs break the mold, work through their fears and insecurities, and to embrace their authenticity. He loves good coffee, craft beer, playing soccer, and traveling the world. Welcome, Patrick. We're so happy that you're here. And I am going to sign off and hand you the reins. Thank you so much for that. Wow, someone from the Netherlands here. I like it. Um, wow. I Anytime I get introduced in podcast webinars, uh, speaking engagements, it definitely stirs up the imposter syndrome. So it's interesting, you know, that we're going to talk about imposter syndrome and am I good enough and where these wounds come from. And then I'm having like my heart beat out of my chest as I'm about to get ready to start talking to all of you about this. And I can't even see your faces. So I just want to take a second to recognize that because I think for all of us, this topic is very um, vulnerable. There's a lot of challenge here and there's a lot of, um, insecurity that comes up. There's a lot of self-doubt, perfectionism, etc. So there is a lot of emotion. And I want for all of you, if you feel open to it, to put in the chat your experiences with imposter syndrome. What made you want to come to this talk today? You know, because we're going to talk about how it shows up. We're going to talk about strategies. We're going to talk about ways to work through it. Um, we're going to talk about some research that kind of associates imposter syndrome with attachment wounding or early childhood wounding. Uh, we're going to talk about colonialism. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that, can, any, can everyone else hear this right now? I just see Dwayne's comment that you can't hear. Um, I just want to make sure that other people are hearing what I'm saying. Hello from an airplane. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. So we're going to get started. And um, I'm going to go through the slides. I'm really not a person who likes to just read at people and uh, listen or to talk through slides, but we're going to go through these. 
We're going to take breaks and pauses throughout so that you can kind of jump in with questions or experiences. So experiences of overachieving comes up a lot when shifting from therapy to coaching. Um, struggle with it and truly difficult to find authentic self. Yeah, absolutely. All of those experiences are, are definitely part of the imposter syndrome process. Doubting yourself and your abilities when people ask your thoughts and opinions on things. Like, why are you asking me? Who am I? Yeah, that's a big one, right? Like, um, I know when I was working as a therapist, I'd be listening to a client and I'd be like, wow, they need a therapist. I was like, oh, I'm a therapist. <laughs> like, I think we've all had moments like that where we are definitely struggling with kind of uh, those feelings of fraudulence or self-doubt. So I'm glad that y'all are feeling willing enough to put that into the chat as well. And I appreciate everyone being vulnerable and, and just being real about it. Uh, you know, Angela introduced me. I'm not going to reintroduce myself. So we're going to talk about terminology. We're going to talk about origination, cultural implications, colonialism, lack of diversity training, uh, the correlation between attachment wounds and imposter syndrome, and then strategies to combat imposter syndrome. So that's kind of where we are going from here. <laughs> Wait, I'm the therapist. Yeah, I've had that moment so many times, you know, like, oh, I'm the therapist here. There's, they're here talking to me. Like, I do have a master's degree in all this training. Um, so I, it, what is imposter syndrome? And, you know, there's not a ton of research that is done on this subject. And a lot of it was done in the 70s um, by Dr. Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes in 1974. So we're talking about like, obviously almost 40 years ago, right? And ultimately uh, a little over 40 years ago, it, a lot of these studies were done on women in the workplace, uh, especially women of color. And the, what was being found is that there was a lot of feelings of fraudulence, inadequacy, insecurity, incompetence, et cetera, that were showing up in the workplace. And I crafted this talk to, for Therapy Reimagined Conference a couple of years ago, and initially it was just going to be about imposter syndrome, insecurity, and self-doubt, uh, things that I talk about a lot. And then I realized like, after talking with some friends, especially some uh, therapists of color, um, that we really needed to have to talk about colonialism, how a lot of these terms have been coined, because a lot of the research is typically done on white women or white people in general. We're leaving out a big piece of the puzzle. And we're also not playing with a fair playing field or uh, you know, a, a fair situation in terms of resources and, and just the abilities to have the same access to things. So I want to name that first. And what we want to do is you know, imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon is a syndrome, something that needs to be cured through therapy, self-help, symptomology. A phenomenon is more like something that exists due to circumstances or experiences, which I think is a big part of this that doesn't get talked about. And, you know, who am I as a, a cishet white man to talk about this stuff because I have all the privilege in the world. But this was crafted after, again, lots of cultural consideration and just a lot of uh, consultation with some colleagues of color. And I think this was really important to have these conversations first before we dive into, you know, how it shows up for us as entrepreneurs and therapists and in the therapy room and, and just for people in general. So, um, Racial stereotypes and their impact, obviously, you know, we we don't have time to go down this road uh, and talk about this stuff, but we want to mention it at least so that we can start kind of being open-minded and just paying attention and aware. So I really want to just make sure that we're having these conversations and getting more comfortable having them. Same with gender stereotypes, masculine versus feminine roles, uh, especially in, you know, in the workplace. So a lot of this was done in office settings and medical settings. And what we're seeing in the 70s, 80s, 90s is that, you know, for the purpose of this conversation and language, we're going to say female identifying uh, staff, right, were going to be found as the nurses, the helpers, the caretakers, where the male identifying staff were going to be the doctors. They were going to be the ones making the decisions in the boardrooms. They were going to be the lawyers. They were going to be the people who had all the power in, in conversation. I think it makes total sense if we're thinking about it in conceptualizing imposter syndrome in that lens, like, of course, women and especially women of color would show up and say like, yeah, I, I don't feel like I should be here. Like, I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel like I'm competent enough. I don't feel like I have enough training. I feel like I've just been let in. I feel fraudulent. A lot of this is a part of imposter syndrome. 
So if we're conceptualizing in that way and we realize like there are going to be different situations where things are skewed because of lack of access to resource, then we have to conceptualize it from that perspective as well. And it's not just simply like, hey, this feeling of insecurity that shows up. It's like, no, this is really validated because of A, B, C, D, and E. So um, I'm trying to watch the chat as I'm talking. So I'm going to stop doing that. I'm just going to stop doing that because I want to answer things, but I, I'm going to leave that for the end. Um, so we just want to be aware of the stereotypes that exist for sure. And I appreciate, yeah, when you're starting a private practice, Catherine or um, Stacy, a lot of you have said this already, like that's where it started to show up of like, who am I to charge a X amount of money? I don't have these licenses or acronyms behind my name. Um, I don't have X amount of training. I'm newer to the field. Other people do it better. Like those are all pieces of imposter syndrome, that self-doubt, that insecurity, that uh, perfectionism that takes over. So again, this was the original intention of the presentation. We kind of changed it to dismantling oppression, colonialism, and mental health spaces and um, have been talking about it from that lens since that time. I want to talk a little bit about how imposter syndrome shows up. And some of you can put this in the chat, like how imposter syndrome shows up for you. These are just some examples. So perfectionism, a lot of us <laughs> have a lot of experience with perfectionism. I myself have a ton of it. Hello from Istanbul. Awesome. Um, it's feeling never good enough. Feeling like I can't put it out there yet because it has to be perfect. I can't write this blog post idea. I can't publish my website. I can't put my psychology today out there yet because it's not done. I can't start seeing clients yet because I haven't figured out, you know, how to use I can EHR or simple practice or whatever you're using. Like I have to know everything before I can do it. And that is paralyzing and it's debilitating because it's like, I am feeling like I can't move forward because I don't know everything yet. And perfectionism is unattainable. It's not realistic. And I would consider myself a recovering perfectionist, uh, someone who really struggled at first to get my ideas out to the world. Good, Brent. I'm happy to hear that. Like you don't belong, especially when you're the only one that looks like you. Absolutely. Yeah. And the perfectionism is painful. I mean, imposter syndrome is painful in itself, but perfectionism, I really do believe to be the most challenging of all of these imposter syndrome syndrome uh, symptoms because of how debilitating and paralyzing it becomes. And I think what we ultimately get caught up in the mindset of is like, we then turn into the expert role where I have to do endless amounts of research before I can finally put my idea out to the world. And we are missing the fact that so much of this is like, we just want to have our authentic voice out there. We want to have our authentic spin on what we're talking about because we don't need to do endless amounts of research to create a blog post on anxiety. Like your therapist, you're trained, have master's degrees. Some of you PhDs, ongoing training, ongoing CEUs, um, never ending supervision, right? Like you have all the experience in the world to put your take on five tips to manage anxiety. But because it feels so overwhelming, and you go into imposter syndrome mode of like, but I didn't, I don't have peer reviewed research. I didn't, you know, do endless amounts of research on this. I don't know the DSM back and forth, like the back of my hand. I can't put this blog out to the world. What I see a lot of, because I do a lot of website auditing and psych today auditing and, and managing people's copy and content is that I can't get this out to the world because my picture is not very good. My website isn't exactly the way I want it. I don't have good headshots yet. I only have a iPhone uh, photo that I can use. I, it's a little bit blurry. It's not perfect. Um, my content doesn't speak exactly to the clients that I want it to speak to. And what you're doing in that situation is you're preventing yourself from publishing. You're preventing yourself from existing. And I will always say that being visible is better than non-existent. And that's what I mean. Like your website will never be perfect. Your psychology today will never be perfect. All of this stuff is stuff that evolves over time and you make changes and tweaks and 
evolution, like the entrepreneurial evolution process, I think it's like a highway. Like you're driving down the highway and you get a flat tire and you pull off and someone helps you change it or you reroute or you get off at an exit because you have to pee really bad. Like whatever the case is. But in reality, like there are so many stopping points and there are so many changes and shifts and who you love working with today is not going to be who you love working with a year from now or even six months from now. If you're ADHD like myself, like your interests are going to change pretty rapidly and that's okay. So again, working through that perfectionism and what I'll do in my coaching is like, we're going to publish this today. I don't care if it's not ready because it will never be like ready in your mind. And once you get out of your head where it's really, really scary and you just get it out into the world, you start taking back the power. And what you'll start to see is that shift internally where your mind is saying like, oh, it's not as scary as I thought it was going to be. Like, oh, publishing my psych today, like the world is still spinning. It's fine. It's not as powerful as we thought. But once it's in, when it's in here, all those irrational thoughts, all those patterns, all those narratives, all those things start to come up. And it's like, this is not going to work for me. I, this, this idea is better suited for someone else. I want to share a little bit real quick and you know, my brain will diverge a lot today and we'll go off on some tangents, but I am here today. I have a very successful private practice coaching business and podcasts and retreats and speaking engagements and all the things. But when I started out doing this, it was during the onset of COVID and I was just doing Facebook lives talking about imposter syndrome and nobody was watching like nobody was watching at all. I was still having that like heartbeat, like, oh, my, my, my chest is beating really hard. Oh, I'm feeling really anxious. The only person watching is like my, sorry, hold on one second. Computer camera's doing weird stuff. Um, the only person watching was my grandmother. I think she was like commenting like, oh, your kitchen looks good or your dogs look so, so pretty. And I'm like, grandma, get out of here. Like I'm talking about imposter syndrome. But talking about imposter syndrome, talking about my own experiences with it, it allowed me to take the power back over it. Because what was happening was like, I was realizing that all of those anxieties and insecurities and that perfectionistic process and the feelings, it didn't matter because nobody was watching it anyway. And then I was like, it's out to the world and you're still experiencing these feelings, but it's still a lot more manageable now because it's out to the world. And then what started happening, the more I started speaking about imposter syndrome and my own experiences with it, is that I started getting invited to do webinars and on podcast interviews and then eventually speaking at conferences. And then people were like referring to me as this imposter syndrome expert. And I'm like, but I have imposter syndrome about imposter syndrome. So like, how can I be the expert? But again, I think this is important to acknowledge that like, this is how we move through that. <laughs> yeah, Catherine, I agree. <laughs> um you know, this is how we move through it. So we have to be able to manage that and move through that as it shows up. Other ways that imposter syndrome shows up, just lucking into your success, right? Like a lot of you have probably experienced, I don't know how I got here. I just kind of lucked into it. I didn't even work that hard for this. Or like, why me? Those feelings come up a lot when imposter syndrome is taking over. If any of you are, have experienced those, you know, please feel free to let us know feeling inadequate or incompetent. So I'm not capable. I'm not competent. I feel unworthy. I'm unable to ask for help because again, asking for help says like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I have to do this on my own. Asking for help is a sign of weakness. All the, all the stuff that we tell ourselves that is so irrational, but this stuff is real. So it shows up for us and it is really, really painful resistant to feedback or advice. So criticism means I'm not doing good enough. We go into our shame response. We go, sh we shame spiral. And what happens a lot of the time because of our, our inabilities to receive feedback in a way that is just critical feedback that we all need, we all need to have, you know, constructive feedback is that we won't allow ourselves to be seen by the world because we don't want to in, we don't want to be vulnerable to the feedback. We don't want to have someone say like you don't know what you're doing. You do like you you are 
fraudulent in this way. You don't know everything about A, B, and C. So it's easier to just not even try. It's easier to not even put yourself out there because it's like, well, if I don't do this, nobody can ever call me out on it or nobody can ever hold me accountable or nobody can ever challenge whatever I'm thinking about. And that's really, a, that's, that's not a wonderful way to move through the world because you never get to share and showcase and highlight the things that you're creating and doing. And if you get that feedback, yeah, uh, Sharice, absolutely. When I get feedback, I feel like I should have known that. It creates that shamefulness that shows up. That vulnerability shows up and says, see, I shouldn't have done that. I should not have put that out there. My camera follows me and tracks me. So every time I move my hands, I see it blinking to like try to do that. <laughs> um, comparison. This is a big one. Comparison, in my opinion, is the thief of joy. And as entrepreneurial therapists, those of you who are in practice or starting practices or you know coaching businesses or podcasts or retreats, it's very easy to get caught up in the I'm not doing as much as so-and-so. I am not as successful as so-and-so. We've all seen the therapist posts of like, hey, I my goal this year is to make $718,000. And yeah, although I encourage this a lot, you know, I want people to make money. I want helpers to get paid uh, appropriately because I think we get underpaid. You know, it can bring up a lot of feelings for people who are struggling, who are like, I can't even get a client to call me. How am I ever going to make $718,000? Um, so that's a comparison piece. And social media really intensifies the comparison trap because social media is shiny object syndrome, right? Like vacations and travel and look how easy this was for me. And I created this coaching part component and sold out all my spots immediately. And you're like, I can't even publish my psychology today. Like, so we can't compare because there's so much behind the scenes that happens for entrepreneurs. Uh, and we don't get to see it. All we see a lot of the time is the facade of like, Hey, here's the end result of all the hard work that went into this, but I didn't highlight the, the hard work, the questioning, the self doubt, the insecurity, the roadblocks, the mistakes, the failures, etc. So it's all looked very, very easy. And now I feel inadequate because I'm not doing as much as somebody else. A lot of things that I hear a lot of the time, another, I don't offer EMDR or IFS. Those are probably right. Like the two biggest like therapy buzzwords at the moment. If you don't offer those things, why would somebody pay me? Um, why would anyone hire me if so-and-so exists? So I live in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, Allison per year, who's a good friend of mine, uh, the owner of Abundance Practice Building, also lives in Asheville, North Carolina. I prevented myself from launching all things private practice for years because I was in an insecurity comparison mindset of Allison exists here. Why would anybody hire me if she offers what I'm doing? And she has this massive reach and audience. Keep yourself small. It's a lot easier because if you don't try, you can't fail. Um, and that happened to me for years. But in reality, we all have different perspectives and voices and ways that we talk about things and things that we specialize in. So just like coaching, where you're going to attract and repel based on what you're putting out to the world, the same goes for therapy. You're going to attract and repel. Some clients are going to be wonderful, wonderful fits for you. And some are not. And that's okay. Because you're not for everybody. And you shouldn't be. <laughs> Therapist on every corner like a funeral home in Asheville. Uh, yeah, that's, that's quite true. <laughs> um, so their social media posts got more likes than mine. You know, that's, that's how comparison shows up. Shame. We kind of talked about this. Shame is really painful. It's one of those, it's one of those experiences. I think that is probably one of the most painful emotional responses we can have. And this goes back to inner child wounding, inner child attachment injury. So I'll give you a personal example. When I was a kid, I was on a canoe trip uh, in Maine with my, my family and I couldn't row properly. Like I couldn't get the boat to go where I wanted it to go. It kept turning the wrong way. And my dad was yelling at me and I kind of shut down. Like I was like, I, I don't know what to do. And essentially what happened is that shame response came over and all the narratives that come up with shame, like I'm not good enough. I'm incompetent. I don't know what I'm doing. This is so easy. How come I can't do it? All that stuff happens and you shut down. And that still shows up throughout life as we become adults. 
And as we're taking risks with our small business ownership and our small business creation, and we're doing things out of our comfort zone, this starts to really start to surface. We'll start to really see that bubble up and manifest of like, that shame response will be so painful and so toxic. And then all those inner child wounds will start showing up. And all of those narratives and all of those thought processes will start showing up and they will shut you down. We talked a little bit about the expert role. I'm going to be an expert in A, B, and C before I create it. It's similar to perfectionism. I need to know all the ins and outs before I speak about it. I hear that a lot from people like, how can I just speak about a topic if like I don't know everything? It's like, does anybody know everything? And that's a good way to learn about the things that you don't know. The soloist, again, I need to do this on my own. Asking for help is weakness. So that shows up as well. Achievement orientation. Like we live in a culture where we are often, we live in a capitalistic society, right? So achievement is paramount for a lot of people. Like this kind of is connected to my self-worth. If I'm not achieving, then I'm unworthy. Rest, what is that? Like how many of you are really struggling to say like, I need to put it down. I need to stop. I can step away. I'm allowed to step away. Doing more and more, but it never feels like enough. So I think that it's like, we've got to really work through this because your self-worth is not connected to your sense of achievement. But you may have been told that your entire life. And that may have shown up as a child where you get an A in math at school, but you got a D in science. And you go home and it's like, why are you so stupid? Like, what is wrong with you? How come you can't understand this? You know, there's a lot of that that comes up. So we have to really work through these senses of like achievement and doing more. And therapists notoriously are high achieving human beings who feel like they're not doing enough. So how do we get to a place where we can say my self-worth is not a direct connection or correlation to my achievement? And I think, you know, inner child work is really important for this. I've been doing a lot of IFS work with my therapist for the last two years, and that's been pretty life-changing. But I was definitely someone who tied sense of work to achievement and productivity. So just really, really working on that stuff as we go. Cultural implications of colonialism, lack of diversity training in the mental health community. We kind of talked about that. Um, we're not going to really go into the John Bowlby, Mary Ainsworth research right now about secure, avoidant, anxious attachment styles. We don't have time. But just for, in terms of imposter syndrome, I kind of think about like secure attachment. We're going to have maybe a little bit of insecurity and imposter syndrome, but it's not going to be paralyzing. We're going to be pretty secure in our decision making. When we're starting to feel more anxious or avoidant, that's when we're going to start to see a lot of this stuff show up. So if we're feeling more avoidant, we're probably going to go into perfectionism mode, uh, expert mode. I have to know everything mode. I'm going to avoid putting it out there. I'm going to avoid publishing. I'm going to avoid creating the blog post that I said I was going to do six years ago. The anxious mode is going to be the comparison traps, the insecurities, the self-doubts, the comparison to other people in the field. Uh, Sarah's doing more than I am. Sarah, I'm just picking on you because you're a friend and I know you're here. Um, you know, something like that. That's where we're going to start seeing that show up. Obviously, you know, we are going to have conflict when we're starting to talk about attachment theory, especially for single BIPOC mothers, um, single working moms too, with attachment theory implications of like, well, there wasn't a healthy attachment made, but I had to work because I didn't have another choice. So like attachment theory doesn't take into, <laughs> you're welcome, Sarah, doesn't take into account all pieces of the puzzle. So we have to be mindful of that as well. Conflicting messages. How many of you have heard these? And put it in the chat if you have, or, or an example of what, what you've heard before. Praise versus punishment. And that means like, again, referring back to the report card example, it could be like, you're so smart, here's a reward for doing so well. Or if you have a behavioral challenge in class, like myself who couldn't sit still or couldn't stop talking, you know, I got into a lot of trouble. So I was always getting straight A's, but I was also getting into a lot of issues at school. And it was always like, you're so smart, but here's this thing. Or like, you're so smart, here's this reward. 
But here's this punishment for not succeeding, not accomplishing all the things. My boss, maybe this isn't the right field for you. Yes, never good enough for mom. Perfectionism demanded. Yeah, and this stuff sticks with us. What's wrong with you? Or you're so smart. How come you couldn't get an A? Why didn't you score that goal? Maybe you should just try harder. You're not good enough at this. All of that stuff is so paralyzing, so painful. And, you know, the day of my graduation with my master's, you're getting your doctorate, right? Yeah, so immediately, Alejandro, like, placing that, like, pressure on you to do more, to do more. Heard, of, heard it all as first generation of immigrants and in the workplace being the only person of color. Why do you need a reward? It is what is expected. Once, yeah, it's, this stuff is really challenging. So you can see how these messages early on really impact our abilities as professionals. Even when we're doing the work, it still exists. It still shows up. Punishment for failure, failure, and challenge not readily accepted or encouraged. That's a big one, I think. We don't talk about failure enough in a positive way. Failure has such a negative connotation. I bet when you hear the word failure, a lot of negativity kind of shows up. And what? Uh, Ava, yes, this web webinar is recorded. Um, so failure is a part of the process, right? Like when you started riding your bike, you probably fell down a bunch of times and got back up. But as a child, because you're more adventurous, you're willing to take risks, um, you're willing to kind of be uncomfortable more. It's like, it's very, very easy to see how you can do that as a child. But as you become an adult, it becomes more challenging. And our society does not normalize failure. And that's what I talk about on my podcast all the time is normalizing fear and failure because failure is a part of the process. It allows us to take a step back and say, how can we change this going forward? What can we change or pivot or what can we get rid of? This didn't work. Let's talk about you know, normalizing the failure process. And there are plenty of very successful people who have had endless amounts of failures. And we should really be talking about it as something that is a part of society. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean that, you know, you will never get, uh, you will never figure out A, B, and C. A lot of the times it's just like, you just started this thing and of course it's going to be challenging. Of course it's going to be a struggle because you don't know. You don't know any different. You've never done this before. When you start a private practice and you're feeling like a failure, you've never done this before. You did, probably didn't get any training in graduate school to start a business. So it's really important to just try to normalize this stuff because it is a part of the process. Again, attachment styles like we've kind of talked about, so we're going to kind of move past that. I'm going to talk about strategies to combat imposter syndrome and insecurity. Um, we all know self-compassion as therapists, but at the same time, we don't practice what we preach a lot of the time. So it is about treating yourself the way that you would treat somebody else when they're struggling. And I know we all have a hard time with that for the most part. Rewriting the script, really important. So for example, when you're starting something new, writing down, hey, you're starting to create a website. You've never done this before. You are allowed to struggle with this. You are allowed to make mistakes. This is okay. So like really giving yourself permission and affirmation to do it differently, to break out of that perfectionism mode. Therapy and mentorship, super important. I've seen a bunch of you uh, putting in the chat that, you know, working through your inner child wounding is really important, but this is lifelong stuff. So like lifelong therapy, really important. Mentorship, coaching, surrounding yourself with people who are supportive, good supervisors. All of that stuff is really, really crucial. So ensuring that you are working through a lot of these wounds, a lot of the, the cultural and societal messages that are kind of keeping you stuck or stagnant or still or feeling inadequate. This stuff has to be lifelong. And it happens in the therapy room. When you have a bad client interaction, a lot of you are going to leave saying to yourself, I clearly am not a good therapist. This, this did not go well. This client clearly did not want to come back here. And maybe they don't. Maybe they ghost you. Maybe they tell you, whatever the case may be. 
But in reality, that is a normal part of the therapeutic process where the rapport is probably just not there and it's probably just not a good fit. But instead, we oftentimes internalize this. We go home, we talk about it in our own therapy sessions or supervision. I'm a terrible therapist. I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I missed this, I missed this. In reality, it's like, if you really think about it, was this the right client for you? And were you the right therapist for that? The odds are probably not. And in reality, there are so many people out there who need mental health support. So you are not going to be the ideal therapist for everybody. And that is absolutely okay. So I really want to emphasize that. Healthy support system, very important to move through challenges. I mean, whether it be colleagues, whether it be um, coworkers, whether it be a mastermind group, whatever it is, having people to bounce ideas off of, to help build you up, to support you, to hold you accountable, to offer constructive feedback. This is really, really, really important. Yeah, supervision is unbelievably helpful if you have good supervision. And I know there's a lot of bad supervision out there. There's also a lot of good supervision out there. Um, vulnerability. Vulnerability is huge. I think it allows you to take back the power because when you can be open and authentic and honest about how you're feeling, when you can admit, I'm experiencing imposter syndrome, I am experiencing perfectionism, self-doubt, whatever the case may be, it allows you to just drop in and get again out of your head, you know, really allowing you to work through it and putting it out to the world. I think it really does allow you to take back the power. I like to think about imposter syndrome as you work through it, as it always exists. It always shows up when you're taking a risk, when you're trying to grow, when you're trying to do something uncomfortable. But once you start working through this stuff, it's no longer steering the car. It's kind of riding alongside you, but it doesn't have control anymore. It doesn't dictate where you're going and it doesn't prevent you from moving forward. Again, putting it out there, like I said, making it playful. You know, we, if we're talking about inner child wounding, we need to be able to evoke and elicit playfulness. You need to be able to drop into that childlike state. Movement is really important. That helps with creativity as well. Give yourself permission to make mistakes. This quote has always felt really powerful for me. And it's by Maya Angelou. And she said, I have written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find me out now. I've run a game on everybody and they're going to find me out. I cannot imagine writing 11 books, yet still feeling inadequate and, and feeling like an imposter. I, I just hope that can resonate for some of you because I think we oftentimes like find ourselves experiencing something and then we feel like we're the only ones experiencing something. And that's what really feels intimidating to talk about. It's almost like the better I do, the more my feeling of inadequacy actually increases because I'm just going. Any moment, someone's going to find out I'm a total fraud and that I don't deserve any of what I've achieved. That's from Emma Watson, obviously a very successful actress. I believe that vulnerability leads to insecurity, leads to growth. Because ultimately, the more that we can be vulnerable, we're going to work through our insecurities. We're going to show up more authentically. We are going to ensure that we are growing. When we are stepping out of our comfort zones, it is a normal process to feel inadequate, insecure, and incompetent. This is just a part of it. We don't feel that way when we're in a place of complacency or stillness or comfort. And we teach our clients that all the time. But we, again, don't always practice what we preach. So it's really important to recognize that the more you're able to do this stuff, the more you're able to talk about it and normalize it, the more it's going to feel like it doesn't have control over you anymore. And that's a really important part of imposter syndrome. Is, and that's a part of human experience in general. 
I see a lot of conversations about supervision right now. The clinical supervision directory would also be a good resource. So I really want to challenge all of you to start putting your ideas out to the world, to publish your website, to publish your site today, to launch your private practice, to start your coaching business, to start your podcast, whatever you are trying to do. And just put it out there. Build the plane as you fly it. Imperfect action, impulse momentum. We don't have to have the finished product in order to do something. We actually have to be able to do it as we're going. Otherwise, we'll get stuck in perfectionism mode and it will never happen. So I want to really just name that. I want to challenge all of you to start putting your ideas out to the world. And that's really where this growth is going to start happening. I wanted to get to questions right around this time. So that was good timing. <laughs> so I want to take questions. I want to answer things that I can. So I'm happy to do that. And I want to talk about um, ways that this can happen. So I'm just looking at the Q&As. Can we get a copy of this recording? Yep, that is going to happen. Uh, I can't hear you. <laughs> I can't. I can't help you there. Um, I never feel good enough for my clients and I doubt that I know what I know. Yeah, I think that's common. And I think the answer there is to really get clear on your niche, get really clear on your ideal client. When you really are working with your ideal clients, instead of just anybody who calls you because you don't have an idea of who you're marketing to, things will feel much more in alignment. Things will feel much more energizing. You'll feel much more confident. But if you're just working with anyone who calls you, well, that's not, you know, it's not a great way to ensure good fit for either side. Uh, Paula, the reference that I mentioned for supervision is the clinical supervision directory, the CSD. Um, so yeah, let's take questions. If you have questions, put them in the chat or in the Q&A and I will answer them. I'm starting this career later in life and find myself hoping I'm able to be effective. I think that humility is a big part of this and I think humility and, and, yeah, these slides will be available, Doreen. Um, humility and imposter syndrome kind of go hand in hand. Like it's, in, it's important to be in touch with the insecurity, the anxiety, the humility that comes with feeling like you don't know all the answers, feeling like you don't know everything. Because I think this is kind of, Andrea, I think you can too. Um, body image for sure. So again, that's why I encourage like, lifelong therapy, because we have to try really hard to work through some of this stuff. And some of this is societal messaging, right? Like that we can't really control, but you can control who you surround yourself with. Um, you mentioned EMDR and something else that seems to be trending. Uh, IFS therapy, Jill, is what I mentioned. The PowerPoint will be accessible. Yep. Yeah. When we're navigating new territory, Leslie, or looking at accomplishments, it's going to flare up because that's when our brain starts to say, uh-oh, this is scary, right? The RAS, the reticulating activating system part of the brain is, is was designed to keep us safe, especially as we were developing uh, prehistorically. And it was telling us when we stepped out of our comfort zone or like, ooh, be careful, better watch out before you go over here. But what happens as we develop, our brain is now saying that when you're stepping out of your comfort zone in terms of professional development, uh-oh, you don't know how to create a private practice. You better step back. Or, uh-oh. Wow, thank you, Andrea. I appreciate that. <laughs> Hands down, one of the best webinars I've ever attended. I'll say this. I do not structure anything. So I just talk about you know what's coming up for me in the moment. And that is a major part of imposter syndrome that I have worked through, but it's also allowed for much more uh, authenticity. Um. So Kara, can you elaborate on how to be more playful in regards to fighting imposter syndrome? So I don't like using the Harry Potter example that I used to use because I'm, you know, I, I'm not a fan of rolling. I'm honestly not a fan of Harry Potter, but it's a good example that we can use in the moment. Uh, the Bogarts in the movies for the kids, their biggest fears, how they moved through those fears was making them playful, putting roller skates on a spider, uh, you know, giving funny voices, funny names to things that were coming up, allowing yourself to be playful. Give your imposter syndrome a funny voice, a funny name, something that when it comes up, you're like, oh, there's perfectionistic Patrick showing up again. I know how to quiet him down. And I don't think it ever goes away completely. I want to be really honest about that. Despite success, 
as you grow and you create more success, the reality is you're going to feel more imposter syndrome because there's going to be higher levels of things that you're accomplishing and creating. So I think it's always there, but I also think that it's, um, it's, it quiets down and mutes itself a little bit. Let me continue to walk through these questions. There's a lot of them. Sorry, I don't know if I can get through all of these. Um, how do you have that conversation if you realize someone may not be a good fit? That is when, I mean, feedback is an important part of a therapeutic relationship. So checking in with your clients to say, how is this feeling for you? I always empower my clients to say, if you don't feel like this is a good fit, I will help you find someone who is because client provider choice is so crucial. And a lot of clients just think they're supposed to show up no matter what. And in reality, it's like, no, if, if this is not for you, we will find someone who is, and I will not take that personally. So it is about having those conversations. I also like the resource of creating a Google Drive folder with all of your successes um, and putting them in there. So it could be pictures, it could be little statements, it could be uh, one-liners, it could be screenshots, it could be any of that stuff. And you put that in there so that when this imposter syndrome is showing up for you and convincing you you're not good enough, you're not qualified enough, you're not competent enough, you go to that folder, you open it up, and you see the examples of all of the ways that you are good enough and competent enough and qualified enough. And I bet most of you, when starting grad school, you had a lot of these feelings like, am I going to pass the tests? Am I going to pass comps? Am I going to do this? And then you felt like it was a breeze like a year or two in and you're like, yeah, this is fine. Like I, this is, this is not hard anymore. The same thing with community mental health. You start a job and you're like, this is really overwhelming. Like I don't understand the processes and the procedures and like, what am I supposed to do when this happens? And then two months later, you're like, oh, this is a cakewalk. Like I could do this in my sleep. Now I, I need to get out of here because this is not like fulfilling for me anymore. So, um, you know, try to remember that stuff because I think it's really important to work through as you go and really ensuring that, you know, you're remembering that you have gotten through times where you have questioned your abilities and your competence, and then you've come out the other side. And those things are so important to remember. So I want to just name that as well. A lot of you are asking a lot of similar questions in the Q&A. I have a lot of imposter syndrome resources. My podcast is all about imposter syndrome, self-doubt, normalizing fear and failure. Um, and that's the All Things Private Practice podcast. So I would check that out because all I'm doing is interviewing other people in the industry, in the entrepreneurial mental health industry who are really doing amazing things, but had to work through this, these feelings to get there and to help normalize that, to share those experiences with the world. Because I think, again, that's what normalizes a lot of this. Um, such a shortage with available therapists. So I feel bad turning someone away because I don't think they're an ideal client. I would rather find an uh, ideal landing spot for clients every single time than just taking people on because I feel bad. I think we're doing a client a disservice when we're just taking them on. If a client calls me who struggles with disordered eating, I don't specialize in that. I don't have training. I'm going to find the right resource. Um, and that's just... The client doesn't care that much. I think we internalize that. We get really insecure about our responses. The client just wants a place to go and talk to the right person. If we give them that resource, we're doing them a service. Um, Jade, you asked to speak about insecurity again. I think that um, insecurity, we have to embrace it. We have to acknowledge it. We have to name it. And then we work through it. So we don't let it just fester and build up and become overwhelming we put it out to the world and we let them know, hey, this is how I'm feeling. You have a workbook in your handout. Will you go over that? Yeah, so your work, the workbook that I give out is just an imposter syndrome workbook with tips and strategies to go through imposter syndrome. So you can download it and uh, make it your own and do whatever feels good for you. Um, Marisol, where did you start to get yourself out there to the world? Uh, <laughs> Facebook Lives, two years ago, talking to nobody. And now I have a newsletter of 15,000, a podcast that has sponsors, retreats, and a Facebook group of 10,000 therapists. And it started with Facebook Lives where only my grandmother was responding. What do you do with clients who suffer from imposter syndrome when society is going through the same thing? You just help normalize and validate. I think that's what you know therapy is a lot of the time, is normalizing and validating. Have you ever received negative online reviews? How do you handle that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to happen. You know, when you own a business, you're susceptible for online reviews and those don't always have to be positive. 
And I think it's just about embracing those and they are going to hurt, right? Because, oh, your the podcast helped you start your private practice. I love hearing that, Vanessa. Um, you know, because that just happens. But ultimately, the good outweighs the bad and we tend to focus on the one negative review versus the hundred positive reviews. And I think that's just how we are, how our brains are wired. How do you find the time to branch out into new ventures? That's a long, <laughs> that could be a question that I could answer in a long amount of time. Um, but yeah, ultimately what happened is I know I didn't want to be a therapist anymore. Uh, Natasha, the name of my podcast is all things private practice. Putting the link is on a sticky message in the chat but I'm putting it in there anyway. It's on all major platforms. We have tons of episodes on imposter syndrome and self-doubt. And my motto really has become doubt yourself, do it anyway. And I live by that motto. And I think it's really important to, uh, to embrace that theory and that philosophy of like embrace the self-doubt, do it anyway. The self-doubt is always going to be there. We get one chance at this life and I don't want to have regrets. So I'd rather try and fail than not try at all. And that's been really helpful for me um, in, in a lot of that. So uh, my other motto is don't be the Applebee's of therapy, but that's not really applicable to today's conversation. But um, I'm just looking through the chat still. If you have more questions, I'm still happy to answer them. We have a couple minutes left. I hope this was helpful. Um, if you're still here and you want to, please join the All Things Private Practice Facebook group. Very supportive group that both Ashley and Sarah helped me moderate and listen to the All Things Private Practice podcast. I would really appreciate that because I think that it is a wonderful podcast and maybe I'm biased, but I also have never listened to a podcast in my life. So it could be terrible. Wow. Thank you, Patrick. This has been amazing. And by the amount of chatter going on in the chat room, I mean, this has been a great webinar for everybody. We are very thankful that you came to speak with us today, Patrick. And um, if you guys um, want to go to his podcast or learn about his retreats, we got the QR codes up there for you. Again, thank you, Patrick. This has been a wonderful webinar. We hope to have you back again. Yeah, thank you. Do you want me to continue to answer these questions or? Absolutely. Go for okay. it. Cool. Yeah, I'm happy to do this. I love the engagement piece, y'all. So I appreciate y'all uh, asking questions. So biggest challenge I deal with at this point in my career, <laughs> uh, boredom. I, my, I don't really enjoy doing private practice coaching anymore, so I don't do it anymore. Um, I mainly focus on podcast retreats and speaking engagements. So I think the biggest challenge for me is like figuring out how to be content with what I've created, which I think is a challenge for a lot of us. Uh, good resources for advertising aside from Psych Today. Your, your website, I mean, your website nowadays is really important. I mean, it's a glimpse into um, how it's going to be to work with you. And my coaching a lot of the time and my podcast and my TikTok series on your psychology today sucks. And here's why is because like we talk like walking DSMs and we don't talk like actual human beings. And I believe relatability is accessibility. So the more relatable and authentic content you can create, the better you will be. But a good website with good SEO that shows up in Google searches is priceless. Also networking within your community connecting with other therapists, psychiatric providers, other people in general who may come in contact with your ideal client. So those would be my advice there. Um, tips for pre-licensed folks. Juliana, I'd have to know about more of what you're asking, but I'm happy to offer that. Um, our Facebook group is fun, Ashley. I agree. Question. I have quite a few long-term clients. They do not want to stop therapy. How do I find out if they're getting what they need? They are reaching their goals. They all have wonderful breakthroughs, but then I hint yeah, I mean, I think abandonment and attachment trauma starts to come up when we're talking about transitioning. And I transitioned from 40 client caseload to zero clients. I no longer see therapy clients anymore. And that took about a year and a half. And it was hard, a lot of hard conversations, a lot of attachment trauma, a lot of abandonment showing up and really helping them find the next landing spot. Because I think therapy is lifelong and evolutionary, but like you're going to see different therapists throughout your life. So I just help normalize that as well. And I let them know, like I've seen endless amounts of therapists and this is normal. And this is a part of the process. Strange question. What QR code website do you use for your QR codes? I think we created those on Canva. Um, can I share your workbook with a client? Absolutely. Go for it. I appreciate you asking. Um, yeah, listen to the podcast. I Heather, I think it's great. I, we've had so many cool guests on there and it's been a really fun experience. And 
<laughs> Catherine, I love the fact that you come to every webinar that I host. So I appreciate you. <laughs> um, you know, even starting a podcast, right? Like I had that idea for years and what happened was I kept putting it off again because of imposter syndrome. Like, I don't know how to start a podcast. I don't know what a podcast is. I've never listened to one. Everyone kept saying, you have a podcast voice. You, you speak so well, like get this out to the world. And, um, ultimately I ended up just starting it, like picking a platform, getting a mic and just starting to record. And now it's been almost two years. We have over a hundred thousand downloads. Um, and we have two sponsors. Like I never foresaw that. I never foresaw any of this. So, um, I think it all started with just starting though, and just putting it out to the world instead of like being so overwhelmed and scared to do it. Vulnerability is real. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how do you use the QR codes? If you scan it with your phone, uh, it should pop right up. Cannot wait to be able to attend to a retreat. Yeah, Danielle, uh, everything for 2023 sold out. Ireland 24 is sold out. Uh, but we will have Greece, Italy, and Southern Spain in 2024, hopefully coming as well. And I'll be announcing that in the next couple months. Uh, as a client with attachment issues, I think giving at least six months notice. Yeah, absolutely. I think, Chris, that's a great strategy for sure. Um I think giving notice three to six months, like to help transition out and then offering referrals, processing what's coming up for them and for you. You're going to want to process that in your own therapy or supervision. It's really important. Um, and there are clients that have same clients for 30 or therapists who have same clients for 30 years. Absolutely. And I think that's okay too. It's just, it depends on the direction of your career and your trajectory. Because if you don't want to be a therapist for 30 years, that is something to start considering. Or if you want to change the clientele that you see or your niche changes or whatever, which is totally okay. Is that okay to have clients forever? Yeah, I think it's okay. I mean, there are plenty of depth psychologists or psychoanalytic therapists who would say, you know, this is a 10 year relationship, et cetera. I'm on my phone, so can I still scan the QR codes? Yeah, I can pull them back up. Um, should be able to scan those, Ava. Um, yeah, I think that our careers, you know, are not, there's no finality to it. It's not binary. And, you know, where you are today, a year from now, it may completely change. Uh, five years from now, like when I, when I left grad school, I thought community health, mental health was the answer, right? Like that was my end point. I just wanted to be a therapist. And then I thought private practice was the end point. Now I own a group practice. We have 15 therapists, two psychiatrists, an office manager, like podcast retreats, coaching programs, like Facebook group. I, I, I just think that our skills are so applicable in so many different arenas that as long as we are doing the things that feel associated and connected to our values and we feel energized and passionate about what we're doing, the sky is the limit for what we can do. Do you think Chelsea will find success under Potter? No, I don't, Vance. Thank you for that question. <laughs> where can we find the workbook? Kelly, it's in the handouts tab uh, up above where it says chat, Q&A, polls, handouts. It's right up there. Uh, all right. Thank you so much for offering. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah. Um, I just encourage all of you to do some of the stuff that we're talking about. A lot of this is um, going to bring some emotion up for you. Uh, I think it's good to process with your therapist or your coach, mentor, supervisor, whoever, but really allow yourselves to just be vulnerable and to be authentic and to be yourselves because I think that's the most important piece of this career is allowing yourself to have permission to be a human because we've been so conditioned to be sounding boards and robotic. And uh, the Facebook group, Risa, is all things private practice therapy. Uh, where will you find the recording? I believe they're going to be emailing them to, to your emails. Um, yeah, 140 clients. You could never keep up with that. It's That's outrageous. It's not even, that's not, <laughs> I, I could go into a really big rant on that. I'm not going to, but that's it's not possible. So I would consider joining a group practice or starting a private practice. And I think, you know, we have to unlearn what we've been conditioned as, as mental health professionals, like to talk a speak a certain way or look a certain way or present a certain way or not curse. I did a good job today. Didn't do it one time. Um, you know, using authentic language, using authentic copy, sharing your story, disclosing a little bit about your struggle. Like I think that is all really important because again, normalizing the human experience is really important. And I think that's a big part of this. 
Um, I'm reading, as a faculty member, vulnerability is real based on student evaluations, which does not lead to insecurities, and you start questioning your abilities, and the imposter syndrome is real so strong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're about at time, but I really do appreciate all of you who showed up and stayed and asked, asked questions and put yourselves out there, and that's a big part of this process. So again, put yourself out there. Um, doubt yourself, do it anyway, and... I really appreciate all of you showing up and just uh, participating in this. And thanks again for having me on here, Angela. This was a, a really fun experience. Thank you, Patrick. It was awesome. We really appreciate this. We hope that we will have you on here again. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. And uh, we will be sending out the recording as well as the handouts and the slides. So you can expect that by hopefully tomorrow. So um, once again, thank you, Patrick, and everyone have a wonderful day. See y'all. Have a good day. Have a good weekend.